uh, what's so great and interesting about it and how does it handle complexity? And um, a bit about me, I'm a software developer now for 25 years, did almost 20 years of Java, uh, switched about five years ago to Go. And for three years now, I'm a co-organizer of the Berlin Go Meetup. And often I've been working as software architect or similar. So I've seen many projects and, and got a good overview of them. Now let's dive into Go. So this is our first little Go program. And uh, many might know I do this quickly. So every Go program is in a package and the main package that you see here is where it all starts. Right? And there has to be a main function. And that's really the entry point for every uh, Go program. And so what we want to do here is reading a file. And uh, we just give uh, the name of the file here. And there's this uh, function read file that we can call. Gives us the content of the file back plus an error, and then we should handle the error. And uh, this just locks uh, the problem out and stops the program. And finally, we just uh, print it to the screen. So this is quite simple. I think as simple as it gets, um, but it's quite boring too, right? I mean, you can read a file in a similar way in almost any programming language out there. And JavaScript is a bit of an exception because it's doing only asynchronous I.O. But uh, that is quite interesting usually. And it looks a bit like between a scripting language and a traditional compiled language. Um, so that's not so great, but what would be cool instead? So if it would be really asynchronous IO, of course, for high scalability, that's the cool thing about uh, JavaScript, that uh, things can go forward while uh, the processor is waiting for um, the IO. And you can do this with multi-threading a bit too with Java, but uh, thread switching takes a lot longer than asynchronous I.O. So that's why asynchronous I.O. is a thing in the Java world too. And of course you want to perform other tasks while waiting for the I.O. And uh, yeah, no long garbage collection would be really great, right? Garbage collection under millisecond or whatever is, is okay, but everything more that uh, you feel that there is a break, uh, it's noticeable, drives up latency, that wouldn't be so cool, right? And yeah, the kicker is Go is doing this all under the hood. You don't see it, you don't feel it, it looks like any boring old program, but it is doing exactly that, right? And this is the really, really kicker thing. So you don't need any callbacks or reactive libraries or anything. And the same goes for network I.O. of course. So any kind of I.O. Uh, is done asynchronous, under the hood, highly optimized, and uh, automatically switching to other tasks uh, that are very lightweight and doesn't cost uh, performance. And this is uh, really cool and you don't have to do anything yourself. So this enables high throughput and low latency services, right? This is the basis why Go became the language of the cloud, right? This is the, the foundation where it's building on. And in this way, Go is very simple, right? If you want to do this with C, uh, this is a lot more work and some other programming languages, you can't do this at all because there's simply no way to, to achieve this uh, in such a way. They don't have this machinery. 
And that's the interesting part. Let's try and do something a bit more involved. Uh, because in the cloud, we not only want to uh, do things quick, uh, we want to, uh, we need some resilience too. And uh, what we do in a Google kind of search is two things. Uh, so one is we do parallel searches, like searching uh, normal web results, images and video, all in parallel. And um, yeah, let's do that first. So we get a query here uh, for um, a search query and we want results back and we want results for for web for images and for video and so what we can do in go is we can create a channel that is kind of a small specialized buffer that is made to uh, for connecting go routines with each other and then you can start a go routine for each of the three searches so they run fully in parallel and there you hand in uh, the result and write it to this channel c this first we will take a look at in a few seconds later um, so timeout handling is important of course if you're google uh, results have to come in quick or you would maybe leave out the video uh, results. And how do we do that? So we want three results. So we do a loop over from zero to three. Or, and then uh, we want to read from this channel now. And this is what we do here. And whenever we do, uh, we append it to the results we return in the end. And if a timeout hits, right, this timeout that we defined here for 80 milliseconds, uh, if this comes first, then we just say, okay, sorry, timed out, and we return the results uh, that we already have. And uh, if all goes well, this case doesn't hit us but the full loop runs through and we return the results as soon as we got all three. And that's a quite simple way, so no mutex or anything needed. And you have the whole parallel thing and we're using processors as good as possible with this. And another uh, key thing that Google is doing, they have a lot of hardware uh, and searches have to be really quick, not only in parallel, different kinds, but they have uh, multiple replicas. And so what we do here is we search three web searches really in parallel on three different machines. And the first result that we get, that's what we return. That's what this first does. That's why it has its name. So how is this implemented? It, we need a channel again. And now we create uh, go routines for every uh, replica that we got. Yeah. And so here they are run. And this runs the replica, the number i, and then here uh, it uses the replica from that are given to us and hands over the query, the result, which is a string, um, is written to the channel, and that's it. Right. The first thing uh, that is read from the channel is um, returned. And then the function ended and everything is garbage collected, cleaned up, and that's it. So we don't have to do a lot of manual things there or anything. It's quite simple to just return the first result of, of a couple. So 
let's see, so timeouts are handled usually in the standard library nowadays. There is some uh, special implementation for that. You don't do this manual thing much anymore nowadays. And most other resilience patterns are implemented in open source libraries. Um, but they are implemented in a similar way, right? They use such an approach usually. And um, yeah, so this makes it quite nice and simple to work with. And you uh, have a quite uh, stable services and, and resilience is a big topic, especially when you are writing cloud services uh, yourself, of course. So other features of Go, um, yeah, layers of abstraction are generally frowned upon. We don't like them so much. Uh, we don't stack patterns on top of each other or something. We try to find a solution as simple as possible. But most of the standard library is only one to three codes deep. Right. Uh, everything that I need, if I don't understand something quickly from the documentation, I just step into the code and then uh, this is really easy. It's linked from the documentation. It's just a click away all the time. And uh, it's easy to get around there usually. And it's really rare that you have to go deeper than, than maybe two or, or three levels. And I never had to go more than five level debug uh, into any dependency so far. This is really cute in, in Java 10 or 20 were normal, right? So I'm, I'm really happy about that. And still most functions fit on the screen and in methods too. It's not that uh, now everything is stuffed into one huge uh, function or something like that. So it's a nice middle way, not, not very tiny functions only, but not uh, the big ones either that are difficult to understand. And yeah, even the heart of the runtime system is quite simple. I saw a talk about it once, this uh, switching of the go routines and so on when uh, IO happens and one go routine is stuck. Um, this is really the heart of it is, is one screen for a round of code and then there is another one or two for uh, edge cases and setup and so on. Uh, but it's relatively uh, simple and neat. It's, it's all readable. It's uh, quite maintainable. So I think uh, debugging or looking into the JVM or the JavaScript runtime will be a lot harder than that. And yeah, bugs and dependencies can be quite easily discovered. I just did this myself a few weeks ago by accident. I found something. While well, I was looking how something would be working, I stumbled over a bug and handed in a bug fix. And next day, I was a committer of an open source library. Yeah, that's a good tradition in the Go world, and it's quite doable. It's not something you have to train for or anything. You just stumble over it, see, and then, yeah. You do it just to be a good citizen. It doesn't cost you too much time, and that's fine. Um, yeah, but in the end, there is no real server bullet uh, since complexity is the ultimate enemy, and uh, that can stack quite high. And no neat code in the small can save you from the big complexity, right? So we have to take a bit more looks into that. But simplicity is the North Star in Go. So try to strive for simplicity wherever we do, whatever we do, wherever we go. And yeah, this is really important. This helps already a bit compared to other things. And there's a proverb, uh, do less, enable more. So usually we don't handle a lot of edge cases uh, in, in an API or something. Uh, what we do in Go more often is um, accepting uh, Lambda 
uh, and that can do all the special things that the customer wants and the API itself is relatively simple and clean and it does less but enables more uh, because uh, the lumbar can do arbitrary things. This is often a good compromise. But yeah, let's take a look how does this scale uh, when things go big. In the old days uh, when things went big, we always had a monolith, right? It was one system and this whole system was only one deployable unit all the time. And yeah, operations insisted on this. They wouldn't uh, deploy a second thing because deployment was a very slow manual process and quite tedious. Has never been really questioned either. And yeah, systems grew without bounds because that's what they like to do somehow. And usually this became a big ball of mud, right? And let's take a quick look at this. Yeah, W class diagram could look something like this. Uh, the outsides, you could still see something and recognize something, but in the middle, it was quite a mess and uh, no chance to recognize anything there. This is even more wild and without colors, you couldn't recognize anything at all. And yeah. So Java has been the mostly used uh, programming language uh, for these monoliths and I've been working with it for almost 20 years, as I said. So I'm comparing with that a bit. And it's really not so nice um, because you have a lot of circular dependencies that are allowed. So between classes, um, for example, but as well between packages. And this is really, really hard because packages is really the biggest uh, layer of abstraction that we really have next to maybe projects or something. Uh, but even there, it's not really 100% prevented in the Java world as far as I remember. And what tools do we have uh, to handle complexity. So generally IDEs are quite good, right? You get structural analysis, can rename classes, methods, can move things around. This works quite well. It's all a bit more on the small, right? You can't do this on the, on the higher level, but you can move uh, code from one package to another. So it's, it's quite good and big companies build their own specialized tooling. Especially Google is very famous for it, but I've never seen it uh, myself, never worked with it, so I can't talk too much about it. Um, nowadays, we like to have microservices, right? And we don't like this big ball of mud anymore, right? And, but there we have now one system and thousand deployable units. Right. There are many, many of those. And now it's like uh, DevOps and, and the whole cloud movement insists on this. And uh, yeah, I don't see it questioned a lot. And yeah, systems still grow without bounds uh, because that's what they always do. And now it's usually becoming a spaghetti architecture, not spaghetti code anymore, the individual parts, the, the Microservices, the babies themselves are really neat, but uh, the overall uh, thing is quite huge again. Let's take a look. Um, when does it make sense to um, split a service into multiple? So how do uh, these uh, microservices come into place? And one really good reason is, of course, uh, when one part must not take down another one, right? If you have two parts and, and one fails and gets a sec fault or something, and the other one is totally important and must never fall down, well, if it's in the same executable, it will go down with the sec fault in the other one. So this is good start to take this apart, right? Then you are much more resilient there. 
Another good reason is if you have to scale differently. So often you have a front end uh, that has to scale for millions of users, and then you have a back end side where you have only few people who are adding things there. And this is uh, just maybe 10 or 100. And so the scale is very differently there, so this makes sense to take apart. And yeah, if parts are really independent, right? if they are naturally really independent, well, then this is a good thing to think a lot about it. At least you don't have to separate it, but uh, you can. It doesn't hurt much, right? And often it's done to prevent the spaghetti code from the monoliths. And there, I'm not so sure that this is a really good reason. Right? We will talk a bit more about that. And uh, yeah, nowadays, even because it's cool and everybody wants to be in the cool club and, and you would be uh, frowned upon or whatever, people would mock you if you would say, ah, oh, we are doing a monolith now, right? Uh, yeah, this is a bit funny. Uh, let's take a look at an example. And here uh, we want to use some cool stuff, right? We want to be a part in the cool club. And so we implement everything with this CQRS pattern. Um, you might not know it. Um, you, there are commands and queries, and these are separated from each other. And the commands are really the uh, parts that write to uh, the database also update state and the queries are the read only parts. So uh, for a shop, for example, you have a lot of read only parts where you um, query the catalog and look at products and so on. And uh, this is done a lot, but the right parts uh, where you really order something and uh, pay for it are way less. So uh, scale can be quite differently there, and this um, does make sense to take apart sometimes. And the CQRS pattern does this systematically kind of everywhere. And yeah, we we want cool service names too, and we, we want to be totally cool, right? And sorry. So let's take a look at the example. Um, sorry. So here I did an example um, for a microservice. Yeah, maybe um, let's take a look what the directory structure looks like. And here we see uh, all these little services, right? They uh, have a name. There's this command where this main package lives in. There it started. And then we have some database access. Here yeah, the business logic is inside, probably. It's often called uh, service, this package. And web is where the HTTP stuff uh, is inside. And we have a lot of those services. They all look quite similar. We have CMD ones and query ones. These are the commands. These are the queries. And so this kind of doubles the amount of microservices again that we get in the end. And yeah, together with the uh, not so explicit names, uh, they might be cool if you know what they mean, but um, it's really hard to find out what this whole thing is doing at all, right? Uh, Hedwig, for example, is uh, the famous all from the Harry Potter series that is delivering mail to. And so this is an email service. And uh, so we have other code names here. And 
yeah, in the readme, uh, there we have the uh, solution to this. So maybe don't start doing that, right? It looks cool as soon as you, as long as you start it, and you are the only one, and it's so much fun, but uh, the next generation of developers will laugh much less than you do, and uh, further down the road, uh, people will really uh, dislike it and won't have fun with it anymore. So that's what I um, recommend here. And um, since these are all so many uh, completely separate services, they are um, small and neat, but they that is very difficult to transfer any um, any code from one to another. I see that this should be a bit different, or to find out who is uh, using the thing that is being produced by this one, right? If a command for to the user service comes in. Uh, where does it go? Who is the consumer of this? Uh, usually you have to grab through the whole code base or something to find out who is doing this. And so this is really difficult. Um, and let's take a quick look how this takes uh, looks like in, in practice. So this is really from Uber. Uh, sorry. So it's a service diagram I got from a, a blog post by them. And um, so it's a, um, it's a nice uh, post and, and but uh, you see these can be really many uh, services, and this is from the uh, famous blog post from Monzo, uh, where they explain how they keep 1,600 uh, microservices up and spinning. And yeah, I never counted the dots, but it should be 1,600. And uh, this is really hard, right? There are some tools uh, like Jaeger to uh, C connections, but then it's not around the code base. You you have to see data packages flowing through it in life. It's more like a monitoring tool. And this is uh, it's quite a big gun. Uh, it's not seen as a developer tool. It's more for, for ops, uh, for monitoring and so on. And you probably won't get your own a Jaeger instance or something, and for that, let's see. Um, so the downsides of this uh, spaghetti architecture, it's really hard to find these providers and especially the users of the data that you uh, need or provide. And so to see the flow, the data flow over the whole system is really difficult. And updating a dependency for 1,000 microservices is way harder, right? And doing this for a huge code base uh, when it's a kind of a monolith is not fun either because they are big and uh, you sometimes can't do it in a single commit or would take you a weekend or something. So this is difficult there too, but uh, doing this so many uh, microservices. You can do this in many small steps, but it takes ages. It takes really, really long. And yeah, moving functionality to other services is very tedious. I only know copy paste. I've never seen a tool or heard uh, of a tool that uh, can do this in an automated way. And cutting services in a different way is more or less impossible. And uh, yeah, most microservice architectures aren't cut in the perfect way. And it changes over time uh, when projects evolve, what would be the perfect way? And so 
this is really hard. Most uh, organizations simply ignore this today. They simply say, ah, it is the perfect way. They, they declare it to be good. And if you can show, ah, oh, it's, it's not that great. And they mean, yeah, but it's, it's not so bad. They, they don't want to do anything about it. And I've been once in a company where we wanted to do something about it and it was really bad. And um, what we did is we threw it all together into a kind of a monolith or a mini monolith and then uh, split it up again in a nicer way. But yeah, this is the only way that I ever heard of that works and uh, getting those things together, especially when they have been growing apart from each other with different dependencies, different dependency versions and so on. This can be really hard. And so question is, might be the future uh, monorepo uh, with several services. So you have one system again, but some deployable units, right? Not hundreds, but uh, not one either. So multiple uh, services only when it really makes sense. So for resilience, for scalability, and if you really have independent parts and it's getting uh, big. And yeah, this DevOps and cloud and everything is really great for us. And systems, of course, still grow. And so how do we prevent this big ball of mud? Even if we have several deployable units, this is still a problem um, because they aren't all of the same size usually. And then you have at least one that is still almost a monolith. And you want to do something against that. So let's take a look what Go does provide out of the box. Generally engineered with scalability in mind, packages are made for encapsulating functionality, so you can't declare yourself to be inside some package later. So either you are compiled with the rest of the package or you are not. And so this is a strong encapsulation. And the big thing for me is dependency cycles aren't possible between packages. The compiler prevents it and this is a huge difference uh, to Java and many other programming languages. So uh, this makes reasoning about code a lot easier. You don't have these knots in your head anymore because things go in circles. You can just go down and follow and follow and follow and you know you will come to an end somewhere. And yeah, the great thing is tooling for preventing unwanted dependencies is quite simple, right? And that is what we would like to explore a bit more now in a, another small example. So here I did this in the monolith. A uh, monorepo way without a monolith. Let's take a look. Yeah, I've got explicit naming, right? So we got a back end part and a front end part. As I told you, for scaling, this often makes sense. Uh, then we have some entities in the middle, probably they are shared by both. Email service, uh, that's probably, um, yeah chat to or it's um, agnostic right generic one and we have a general logging library here that is uh, good for our project so we're using that everywhere so x uh, and tools under it this is the the classical way in, in go and we have this CMD again, where we have the executables under it. So it's a shop, and this is the, the front end of the shop. And for the back end, we have here the executables. Here's the back end of the shop. And this will be interesting. Uh, we have a part of the back end for the front end. 
this is something I will talk a little bit more in a minute. Uh, let's take a look what parts we really have here. So at the front end, we have um, deal with customers, of course. And um, payment is important. Right? There are different payment types, bank transfer, credit card, and so on. And of course, the shopping cart, right? These are the, the things we really need in the front end, but we need a bit more, right? We would like to have a product catalog. We want to search products and so on. This is not part of the front end code here, but it is part of the back end. Here is the uh, catalog. And this is a bit funny, right? Because, uh, yeah, the catalog is changed by the back end. And this makes sense, uh, and it's kind of owned by them. If they delete something uh, there, you can't uh, order it from the front end anymore, and so on. This makes some sense to have it in the back end, but I said scalability, if it's different, it should go uh, with the front end. And how do we do this? Well, we can do a simple second executable that just pulls in the read-only routes, the HTTP routes that don't change anything. Uh, there are uh, fewer, only the ones that are needed by the front end. And then we have a quite small, lightweight executable. And this is something we can scale together with the front end and deploy it as often as we deploy a front end. And so, we can still have a big back end deployed only two times maybe and the front end and this back for front this front end part of the back end kind of can scale uh, freely as much as we wish and so we have taken this cleanly apart but still things that belong together uh, because they they handle the same thing like catalog data uh, are in a similar position in the code. So this is already quite nice, um, but now we want to see how uh, can we prevent this spaghetti code thing, right? And there comes something interesting. We can use some tooling and this is something we can see here. I got a configuration for a tool. So, uh, cool. Now, um, I can declare tool packages here. So, I set the um, Sorry, the X logging is a tool package and the entities are uh, like a tool too. They can be used uh, anywhere and they don't have any dependencies. So that's my definition of a tool package, right? Something that doesn't need any of the other packages, but uh, can be used more or less anywhere in the code base. And so here we have everything under X, which is only logging currently, and then these entities. Then we can have something uh, like database packages, which uh, are allowed to access tool packages, but um, they aren't allowed to uh, import any other packages than tool packages. They can be themselves uh, imported into uh, the standard business uh, packages. And so the standard packages, we don't declare any special. This is the rest. And what we do declare is the maximum size of a package that we want to allow. And because sometimes we have somebody too clever who doesn't want to take care of this and throws all the code into one huge package. And this wouldn't work with this anymore, right? And 
yeah, then uh, we allow some additional things. Um, emails. Uh, so this email package is needed for uh, handling users if uh, you want to reset the password or for customers too, and for payments uh, to send out uh, that the payment uh, worked out and uh, you will get the goods now sent to you. So this is a bit how this uh, works. And Let's take a look. So this has some documentation, this configuration, and it is relatively readable even for a larger project. It's not too big since uh, there is some structure given already. And so I like this quite a lot. And this tool can do another nice thing. Um, it can give you a table with all the dependencies. So you get here all the packages, once in the columns and another time in the rows. Yeah, and then you can see who is importing and what is being imported. And so for example, this X logging tool package is imported uh, everywhere else, right? Because lo logging is uh, good to have everywhere. These entities are imported quite a lot, not everywhere, but quite a lot. And um, here, these are the, the main uh, packages, and they do import themselves a lot. And this is okay because they are there for to pull everything together. This is their role. They don't do much, but they import a lot of functionality and just cobble it together usually. And this comes uh, out automatically. There's a legend uh, where you see what kind of packages there are and how they are marked with these uh, letters and the and, uh, Formatting. So this is that. And let's go on. So this is the spaghetti cutter that I wrote, and it's open source uh, documented. You can use it. Uh, the 1.0 version I will release in, in February. I first need a bit of a break uh, and then uh, some tests missing, but the functionality is already uh, there completely. And it's a command line tool for CI pipelines and you can use it on developer machines too, of course. Uh, runs quickly and it prevents uh, spaghetti code with error messages and a return code. So return code um, non-zero in the CI pipeline usually stops the CI pipeline and then uh, you get an, an email or whatever, a Slack message uh, with the error message. And so configuration gives you a bit of documentation and a good overview and this dependency table is generated automatically. And yeah, so you get a full package there, I think. And yeah, this is my conclusions now. Um, so Go encourages uh, simplicity wherever it can, I think. Microservices can cost a high price if you overdo it. And reasonably sized services can be a great compromise. And then tools like this spaghetti cutter uh, are preventing this spaghetti code. And then you can go big and uh, in, in as good as it gets, right? And I think so please enjoy your pasta, nice bites, and yeah, thank you very much. 
And if you have questions, please uh, ask now.